this panel has been organized by our own Madeline Kane, who is herself a graduate of the MPW program. And her graduate thesis was published as her first book of nonfiction. Your second book. I can't keep up with these people. Um, uh, and her most recent book uh, is the award-winning biography of race, horse, jockey, legend, the feet. And uh, so, so she's here today. She's organized this amazing panel of very generous uh, literary professionals and uh, agents, and uh, they're such conduits for us as, as writers. So um, I'm going to turn the afternoon over to Madeline and she'll tell you about the structure. And here's Madeline. Joy Nicholson, John Morris, Sandy Alt, and Margaret. 
Dr. Lee, Leslie Davis. And lastly, we have Ken Sherman, who is the president of Ken Sherman and Associates, a Beverly Hills-based literary agency. An agent for more than 20 years, Ken represents screen, television, and book writers, and also sells film and television rights to books, plus life rights. A few of Ken's clients include John Updike, David Gutterson, who wrote Snowfall and No Cedars, Tawny O'Dell, whose first novel, Backroads, became an international bestseller in Oprah Book Club selection. He also represents Anne Perry, the world's best-known Victorian murder mystery writer and an author of 50 books, plus the estates of Louis Brunel and John Person. Please welcome our family. Flat 
no. <laughs> and the other, I said, what do you mean? She said, no. You're going to learn how to read books on your computer. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I don't know how to read it. That's so such <laughs> so for sophisticated. Uh, and I learned, you know, it took about a moment. You know, I can know how to scroll a book. And I can do it faster on my computer than I can actually turn the pages. And I don't have to have the paper around and feel guilty seeing your book sitting there. <laughs> Yeah, for me it is. <laughs> <laughs> guilt is good, but sometimes guilt is difficult because I really have let it sit for a long time. I feel even worse about reading it. And then I don't read it. I feel like I'm trying to write you, oh, I'm so sorry, and I'm very apologetic. And, yeah. So when these emails come in, do you read them, or do you have a secretary read them, or an intern, or? Because I'm assuming whether it's mail mail or on your computer. I myself. Yeah. No, no, no. I have um, a reader who has an MFA from Otis, is very seasoned, and I really rely on her. Mm -hmm. um, some things will come directly to me. I brought my cards that have my direct to me email mm -hmm. on it, so I will hear, I hope, directly from you, and I will certainly look at that. But I have a special email box on Gmail that's on all my submission requirements on my website, on Publishers Marketplace, and Agent Query, all the different places where you might research me, I find it kind of blinding. And that doesn't help me in the rest of my work. What do you mean blinding? There's so much of it. There's, a, oh. there's you know, and, and for some reason people really, and I don't think this would be true of you at all, but in terms of what we're dealing with every day, people don't tend to pay attention to what we handle and what we don't handle. And so, I say three quarters, I don't know what you guys, I mean, or maybe 90% is stuff that I don't handle. And yet you still have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So that's daunting. Ken, do you read? I read, I end up reading everything that comes through the office, but as, as the material comes in, either, first of all, we always say we only take by referral, because people, this is not referral. I mean, this is referral. People who just call in or send in an email, usually we won't even read it. I, I'm sorry to say. It's, it's not a very nice thing. But there's just too much of it in a day. And it's constantly coming in, which I guess is a good sign for my company. Or people just get my name like the other 200 out of the LMP, the literary marketplace, and send it in. But I have interns who are working in my office all the time. And by the way, I'm always looking for good interns, if that's a possibility at some point. Mm -hmm. um, they often read it first, or, and again, yes, embedded in the email, not an attachment. It's also another step. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a labor thing which sounds precious, but it's not. Um, but more than anything, we don't want to get a virus. Um, I very often will give it to my interns to read, or for a second opinion, if it's a career letter. But I, I usually ask for, that's usually three pages. I do usually 10. The author's bio, and a full two-page synopsis of the book. We get to that point. That's what I'm going to request. If you send something in that catches my interest. And by the way, catching my interest, we're talking about TV shows that we all watch at lunch today before coming here. And um, it's all about taste. And it's all about what you like. And people say highbrow, lowbrow. I don't believe in that stuff. You either like what you like or you don't like it. And some people say, well, how can you read that? How can you watch such and such? Now, how can you watch reality shows? I really watch American Idol. Not in the beginning when they're humiliating <laughs> other people, you know, the ones who are really you know, talented. But when it gets down to a real competition, I used to play piano at a bar, so I totally identify with them. Uh, so I do read everything, but very often some of these before. That brings up the next question. What are you looking for when somebody does submit to you what happens? What, do you want to be turned on? Do you want to get excited? Or are you looking for what you think is selling in this matter? Uh, let's see. I, you know, I was just on vacation and I read a book. I had the luxury of sitting down for five hours and I read something all the way through and it was this book, Little Bee by Christopher King. I don't know if anybody's read that right now. And so 
so I tend to deconstruct while I'm reading to see what's making this work. And so I was able to, while I was reading, uh, pick out all the things that were appealing. Start with a really unique voice. From page one, you realize that the person is going to tell you a wonderful story. And then I look for the quality of the writing. And then I look for story promise. And he did all of this, you know, in the first couple of pages. So I look for a unique voice. I look for a question that's going to be answered. I kind of look for what's at stake, the page turning aspect of it. I look for the quality of the writing, and I look for um, the other extracurricular activity that's going on there. What are the insights? What are going to learn about the world? In this book, the extracurricular is the globalization. I did not know about oil to the extent that this this plot is based on. And I won't give too much away because that's just okay. okay. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Right, but it's it's all those things. What about a nonfiction? Uh, nonfiction. Um, nonfiction is is really changing. I mean, the reference books that we used to sell and sell well and they were backlist has been up, replaced oddly enough by Google. And I have had a couple of proposals that I sent out on reference books where editors said, you know, we could really Google that. It's, so the things that I'm looking for are subjects, I like to say the quote even in the obvious, like Zen Golf is uh, a book about the mental game, but it's got Buddhist reference points in it. And so I, I look for that kind of work even in the obvious. Um, I look for something that I don't know about, and I love, I love to make sure, I really want to make sure that the author is qualified to write it. They have some kind of reputation, um, platform, um, uh, the ability to get to the media. I look for interesting subjects. Um, I don't usually look for things that are so already done and just a different spin on them. So I, if you look on my, I don't have my website up yet, but if you go to Publishers Marketplace, I do have a website there, and there's a complete listing of everything that I've sold. I love um, things by experts, so I'm really important. Sally, fiction first, and then fiction. I tend to gravitate towards um, what I call kind of the American experience. That just seems to be uh, true to what I've, I've experienced so far. Um, not to say that I would look at anything with a more international appeal. I, I read everything. Um, but for some reason, um, stories that, that cover the American experience would be something I'd like to pick. This uh, takes place uh, in Nebraska and in the state of Las Vegas. And the leisure seeker you know, takes place mostly in Michigan and then coming to California. Sort of these American journey type um, stories. Um, but, you know, it's again, it's all about the voice and the writing um, um, being taken places. I, I want to work on something that I'm very passionate about because it's very hard to, to find and publish it for fiction. So you have to really, really fall in love with the work and, and have it be, uh, you know, that you're having the same experience of reading it as you hope the person that you're picking it to will have. Um, on the nonfiction front, yeah, self self help and methods books have been kind of tough. I mean, I get pitched them a lot, but I do a lot of research when I when I get a query and it sounds somewhat interesting. I'm gonna look you up on Google. I'm gonna go on Amazon. I'm gonna start looking and see if what other books have been published in the last ten years, and really um, kind of. I have to really prove to myself to say yes before I take any farther than that. And of course, the credentials are really important. Um, but I also like, I like to be surprised. Uh, one of the books that I represent is coming out next uh, year. It's uh, a good title that said, Does It's Me, You'll See Me Naked. It's uh, a funeral director in Ohio that wrote this, this great story of his experiences. And it's like, oh, this is great. I love Six Feet Under. I love that show. He's even has, he even has a chapter like, Would You Let Your Daughter? Uh, do I have a green purse? I'm like, yeah, you know. So I, I tend to have kind of a little bit of a, you know, intellectual quirky side, and that just appeals to me. So, um, so I think it really is helpful to have a look at the books that we have represented, 
And, and not to say that I want to get another one of the funeral director book, that you know, I have one, but to kind of get a sense of our sensibility. Um, and like Ken was saying, you know, I, I, I love, you know, shows like The Mentalist, I love the car he drives, I, you know, I, I just, the things that are kind of probable. <coughs> The great thing about being an agent is that we get to do whatever appeals to us. So, if you look at all of our lists, you would see that there's some threads that run through them, but at the same time, they're weirdly broad, but that's the fun of it. So, I've represented in fiction, I've represented everything from a 500 page novel in verse that counterpoint, a smaller house that was amazing and brilliant, got to start a PW review, to chiclet and mysteries. And I, I like that range. Um, I really like voice. I was so struck in the airport bookstore when I picked up Little B. And that first paragraph just, you know, was ripping. But you've all had that experience. I really feel that what happens to us is exactly the same thing that happens to you when you're in the airport bookstore <laughs> looking for something to take on the plane. We may see something that's five six of the way there as opposed to all the way there, which is what you're going to more or less find on the bookstore shelves. And we may sort of get in that mindset of, okay, I know how to fix this, and I think it will be fun to help the author fix it. Um, but it's not that different, that impulse. And also, the, the, we make up our minds fairly quickly. Um, certainly in saying no, we make up judgment. We make up our minds really quickly. Um, for nonfiction, I totally agree with you about what has happened with Google. The bottom has fallen out of certain kinds of soft reference. <coughs> you can't sell them. I still like um, expert-driven stuff and research-based self-help, say. And if you have a kind of platform, I have a local author named Wendy Mogul who wrote a book called The Blessing of a Skin Knee, which is a parenting book that a lot of people, I mean, it ended up on the New York Times bestseller list five years after it came out and a lot of people know about it. Um, she speaks all over the country to these very large groups. And it, her um, speaking practice started out much smaller than that. It was regional. And when I sold her, she had a regional platform, but it was a big enough regional platform. One good thing about LA is, I come from Cleveland, and I often joke that you know if you had a regional platform in the Midwest, it wouldn't get you that far with New Yorkers. But a regional platform on the West Coast actually does. But she really used the book to leverage um, her ability to speak. And so she's able to sell zillions of copies of this book to people she meets. And that has really, that kind of understanding that you have to help the publisher build an audience, which is hard, I have to say, it's hard. Um, but seeing a glimmer of that is wonderful. I recently took on an author who's writing commercial women's fiction. She was recommended to me by an editor in New York. And her query letter said something about how she's blogging now. Um, and she's really trying to kind of lay the groundwork for when her novel comes out to have people who follow her. She's very, very funny. You know, she, she has a growing audience for her blog that she hopes to be able to transfer to her novel. So those kinds of efforts. The days are gone where you could turn something into a publisher. I mean, long gone turn something into a publisher and go, my job is done. So with fiction and nonfiction, I think we're looking for people who can see that as a challenge and maybe even kind of fun, the promotion. Well, my colleagues are incredibly articulate, and I agree with everything they're saying. I don't handle, per se, uh, nonfiction writers, though one of my clients is a lady named Starman who is probably the best-known witch in the world, best-known pagan, um, major ecologist and feminist. And we have 12 books already. And a couple of them are actually uh, fiction <laughs> books. And one of them is in development as a feature. So what I'm also looking for, and by the way, initially, do I relate to the writing? Does it pull me in? Can I, can I become passionate about your passion? and your professionality when you bring your pages to us. There are very few things you can control when you submit to an agent or to a studio or to a publisher, but you can control punctuation, grammar, spelling, and if you do send in pages, real pages, hard pages, no coffee stains, or nothing that says, uh, 
written in 1989, which is always a death. Uh, right. Uh, but I'm also always looking for something that can be made into a film or a series. And you never, ever know where something's going to go. For example, uh, one day I was sitting in my office and my secretary said, um, I'm trying to blank somewhere. The guy who produced Cats, Les Miserables, Cameron McIntosh, was calling from London. I thought it was a friend doing a joke with me. <laughs> and he produced Cats, Les Miserables, and Saigon and Family in the Opera. And he said, I've made a deal with Warner Brothers for the musical stage rights to The Witches of Eastwick, and I'll close it if you can deliver your client's book rights, because I want to meld the book and the movie script into a musical. And we negotiated for a year and a half, for a year and a month, and suddenly we had on the West End, the Witches of Eastwick, the musical, for a year and four months, and then I it. I'm now negotiating for the Manuel Estate for the Exterminating Angel, an opera deal, out of nowhere, out of nowhere. This is what I'm saying. By the way, you all think you're one of your writers. Maybe some of you are better as producers or as editors, or God forbid, agents. <laughs> <laughs> you can you, you, you where you're going to leave your minds open, just as when you're writing something, you want to leave your mind open so that you go into that dark corner. I'm not interested, I think, in just a run-of-the-mill thing, something that parrots a book that's just come out that's a big hit. I'm looking for that individual voice, that passion that, that's so overused to think about it. We need to, I need to become excited about your work. I don't believe that I can sell it unless I'm involved in it. And that is ideally reading page 1 through 10 and saying, please send the entire manuscript as an attachment. And then just spend the rest of the night or the next day reading it. That, that's in, in one way we're having um, you brought up the word platform, and I think that as writers we hear that word a lot. And for people who are just beginning and, and who do not have the background, I would love if you each address what you mean by platform and how a writer should go about establishing a platform. Platform um, is uh, the stage on which you reach the public. And that platform could consist of any kind of media. It used to be radio, TV, etc. But now it's blogging, Twitter, all that stuff. And um, it's very, very important now. And I think everybody here will agree with me. I won't say too much because people all can add to this. But um, in some cases in publishing now, the platform is more important than the content. So I'll press this one. Um, I just also want to speak on the fact that um, it's, it, you have to balance. You, you, you don't want to be so platform focused that that you don't let your work breathe and have the, the content. Because I have had experience where I've had some projects where they had fabulous um, credentials, but they just weren't right for that particular project. So it has to. They both have to work together. But, but you also have to think of it's, it's everything that you do in your world to bring people and networking opportunities into your life. So it, it has to be somewhat like you have to have some intention and have it a long time horizon. We're talking several years where you, you start associating yourself with professional organizations and like minded groups. Have a website that doesn't just sit there and look pretty but has links. It's all about linking and, and forming a community. Of like, you know, there's been some famous uh, blogs that have turned into books, and which I think is an interesting phenomenon because you're like, well, why would they just read the blog? Why does it get a book? Um, but you know, they've managed to because the content in the writing is so appealing. That's why they go off and they it to their website, and they've kind of created this phenomenon. And publishers are, are very, um, they like showing you objects. So if you can provide them a shiny object for them to get excited about it, then that's a great thing. So. Well, also with blogs, there's some way of quantifying your audience, which also appeals to publishers, because they're kind of risk averse. 
before we follow up and we, we have a further thing. Um, well, an exclusive means that you're giving it to one agent before you're giving it to others. And usually, what I would hope you would do before you do that is that you research the agent's work. That you know, this is the agent you want to be with for what reason. Because very often, not very often, but I have found myself in situations where I've gotten a submission, I've read it, I've stopped everything, I've read it overnight to find out that other agents have it. And so, um, you need to tell the agent that it's a motion submission. And if you are giving an agent an exclusive, I think two weeks is very good. And um, you should put a limit on it before you give it to them. And I don't have to see things exclusively. I can deal with multiple submissions. But I need to know that if I'm going to read something overnight, it's because you wanted to be with me. You weren't just doing a, you know, throw everything against the wall and see what you come up with, because that happens a lot. And, and it's understandable. But I think for your own um, benefit, you should research the agents that you're sending it to so that if they do come back and say to you, I love this, I really want to represent it, you're not putting them in a beauty contest with you know, four, and many of you don't admit that there are many more than four agents out there that has been out to. So, we know this. <laughs> so, make sure when you send it out to an agent, it's an agent that you really want to do. Um, I rarely ask for exclusives, and I mean, what I, what I do do is if I get a learning script, I just say, hey, I, I'm assuming that you may have this with other agents, just let me know what's going on with them. And, uh, one of the reasons I don't like exclusives is that to me it, it, uh, it, it puts the burden on me to get back to you quickly because I don't think you should go beyond two weeks with it. In fact, I, if I go to conferences and somebody will say, oh, I had this exclusive with an agent and they've had it for two months, I'm like, that's terrible because you're you're taking yourself out of mm -hmm. your potentials and it's just going to make your process go too long. Mm -hmm. So. I think if you're going to do that, do that very um, judiciously. And um, yeah, I'd like to know if I'm reading the whole thing that I'm, I'm running and not have a chance to, to, to go for it if I like it. But you know, I, I also, I'm also looking at it from the writer's point of view too. So that's why in the initial um, query, we assume that you're sending out to them. Just don't put all our names on your set. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
But sometimes, listen, I, I sold a book uh, recently uh, with the help of another office uh, where I had sent it to about 20 people and the 18th person they sent it to made a deal on it. And we got a, a very respectful uh, advance on it. And the paperwork would probably be signed Monday. Uh, so you don't know how long it's going to take. That's another thing, you know, once, once we have a property, how long is it going to take us to help you sell it? Or, you work with us in that. I just want to be sure to say that. You work with us. We work with you. It's not your handling to us, someone said earlier, and then go off and, and do your magic. Uh, we talk all the time, or we email all the time. Um, I think I've lost a little bit where we're going with this, but that, that's what <laughs> Uh, thank you. We, we hear a lot, we read a lot about how the book industry is changing. I would love it if you could each just uh, let us know how you are seeing the changes and also uh, what, what kind of books are selling these days. Oh, um, well, how is changing? Publishers are not buying as many titles. Um, they're not paying the advance that they used to. They're buying more and more books that are very pop culture. -y. And I think many of them are magazine articles that have been extended. I don't know how they're going to last on shelves. Um, I think, I'll try to be as, cover as much as I can here, but I think with fiction, multicultural fiction is very, very popular right now. Things that have a multicultural aspect to it in a very sort of commercial plot with literary sensibility. I know that's like saying, okay, stand on the head and then one arm and then do this and then do that. But there are people who are doing it. I mean, Monica Lee first, I think, started this whole multicultural, brought it really, really to the front. And now it's just zooming. This week would be this is really there. Um, so it's changing that way. I think uh, somebody mentioned before editors are buying books who, uh, by bloggers who are becoming very popular. Politics is a very big subject. Very, very big subject. Um, business is still, uh, the categories are still in place, but there's, you know, there's twist to each, each one of them. Um, but the real issue is that publishers are buying less and less editors are very, very overworked, and there's fewer of them. So uh, what they're buying is, and they are looking for people who are going to be able to promote. Well, um, from the agents I know that do YA, young adult, and romance, and all the things that I don't do, that, those are very uh, popular genres. I don't do genre fiction, so. And that's just because I, it's not what I, what I gravitate towards. It's not my, you know, what I read. So I, I just, uh, I, I pick up some of the romance books, and I'm like, if I had seen them in the slush pile, I would never have been part of your bestseller. So I just, I, I just don't, you know, I never got beyond Jane and Eric. So. <laughs>
blocks have kind of stepped in to fill that breach, and there are a lot of them for genre fiction. Um, also, things that still make sense in book form. I have been doing a lot of cookbooks and design books. Maybe the iPad will change that, who knows. But, but right now, those really need to be physical books, and people, the cookbook market, for example, is really, really, really strong. Um, your platform is very important there. But there are publishers who are willing, partly because they're not going to pay as much as some other publishers. They're willing to work with people who have had that medium-sized platform that I was talking about before. <coughs> um, the, the scary thing that's going on, but it's also really exciting, is it's hard to know what's going to happen to bookstores as e-books get more and more important, that whole bricks and mortar infrastructure is likely to crumble. And it's so unclear, it's so shifting now how word of mouth gets started. We have always thought for years in publishing that independent bookstores are the ones who have started the word of mouth, and if they're in danger, then what? So that whole landscape is changing, and yet how it's not clear yet. I think if you have a good book, or a good screenplay, or a good teleplay, or a good life rights story of your own, or someone else's that you, that you control rights to, uh, if it's good, I feel I can find a home for it, even though people may say that particular area is, is not selling today. Maybe we can revitalize that area. But one of the biggest problems today in all of those areas, meaning film, and television, books, uh, is that the, starting with the executives to the editors and the support staffs at the publishing houses are being fired left and right. Same things at the studios. I was on the phone with the head of TV movies, miniseries, at Sony Pictures Television last Friday, a week ago, about a project that I have with them. And they said, we're so, I, I couldn't get her on the phone on the day before I got the head of business affairs, that's the attorney like person who negotiated the deal with me. And she said, can my friend so over the time? And I got her on the phone, but the reason was she still had her job. <laughs> Sony Pictures Television in November had a bloodbath, a fire of 1,200 people. And they did it a reasonable amount like that again three weeks ago. So all the people, all the editors are having to they don't edit anymore, as someone else was saying here. Uh, one of my colleagues was saying, we have to bring in something that is ready to be published, ideally. You can't take it any further. And it may be five or ten times that we go back and work with you on it. Or I very often send uh, authors, book authors, to uh, one or two different private editors. You'd be surprised how many well-known authors work with private editors. Because editors do not have the time to edit anymore. They are, they are hound dogs for finished product. Same thing with the studios. Same things with the sub rights people, subsidiary rights, meaning film and television. I do a lot with Knopf, Vintage, Shock and Double Day, and so forth. They sometimes bring pro, uh, books that they control the film and TV rights to, and suddenly an entire person is gone in one of those places uh, who handles the sub rights, and they have because those are all under the Random House banner, it suddenly give the guy who's handling all the Knopf books, all the Double Day books, to handle as well. And suddenly, when he was overworked to begin with, he could do an eight to six working day, sort of, he's now seven to eight round the clock, saying, I have no choice. I want to keep my job. I want to be where I am. So, therefore, they're not going to buy as many books if they don't feel it's a sure shot. Uh, maybe we should talk at some point today about the, the committee quality of what book is submitted to an editor. Well, that, let, let's, do that briefly. let's do that briefly, because I have a couple more questions, and I know they have a lot of questions. Too. But let's talk about the, the committee aspect of when, when an editor likes the book that you give to them. Tell, tell everyone what happens. Well, my experience is you probably have heard of uh, myself. Uh, say you send it to editor A, who loves the book, and then at 
there Friday, 8 a.m. with lots of teams using bagels, and they so they cut out the locks because it's too expensive to cut them now. Uh, they want a committee of eight, which it takes, to okay a book. This is, this is a version of how it goes. Uh, they want everyone to do their weekend read or the weekend read with the script at the studio or at a production company or at a network. And but what those other eight people want you to do is to read their book and to give the okay. So with the consensus, the book may be taken on that way. Well, yeah, and also, you know, they've, they've, come, they've come to the meetings with, like, this profit loss analysis and coverage and, and and you know they, they estimate what your book's potential is, and, and then you have to understand that your your editors competing with other editors for their own pet projects, and it's kind of like sort of a, a I don't know what would you call it, death by elimination, elimination, yeah, elimination. Well, there's also only so much money that the publishing house or the network for the studios can put out. One of the conversations I was having with the head of TV movies and mini series at Sony Pictures Television is she's saying we have been told to cut back. And she said, I don't know how we can cut back anymore. I'm down half my staff, including support staff. Which is by the way a great way to learn any of these businesses. You want to get your foot in the door in any way you can to learn how, how everything works. There's a really good article in the New York Times about the most called um, James Patterson Inc. Oh, yes. I, 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 I put it out and, and very, very interesting. They, they got some behind the scenes numbers. Um, um, their quote was that one out of every seven card cover was James Patterson. <laughs> so anyway, we got we have some mob friends <laughs> you need to take out the offer. <laughs> Oh, it's a <laughs> I just add something here. I mean, this is all sounding very bad newsish, but if you read Publishers Weekly, the first pictures, yeah. um, you'll see all the wonderful books that I did. How about the I mean, tinkers? Right, exactly. Yeah. Are, right, exactly. And so, um, please don't be discouraged. You're just hearing sort of behind the scenes stuff, and uh, good books get through. So we would be saying, no, we, we have to do that. that. Yeah. We, we, we all have that. beat the system stories, and we love beat the system stories. We love them. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think you go into the parks because you think you can have a yeah. yeah. well It's because of a passion. Yeah. I think, I guess sometimes we tell these stories because we do want our clients to be proud of their thicker skin and be armor and be understanding that it's, it's, it's very manic. You're going to have high highs and low lows, and you have to kind of see it as a long, you know, there's there's very few overnight successes in it. You know, you may think, oh, this person just wrote a book and it's a bestseller. Well, it might be their ninth book, and the other eight books are under the bed. So that was true with Jonathan Kellerman. That's right. I heard him interview once. It was his ninth book that was published. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes we do tell the horror stories because you know I I, I do deal with a lot of um, new authors and their expectations are sometimes so, you know, the lottery, and my job is to kind of try to give them the tools so that they can have a career and not die on every, you know, battle, and that, you know, that, that, that it's just one day. And, and if you do the work and you're passionate about it and you believe what you're doing and, and devote yourself to it, I think it all comes, it follows, and you can't, you know, you can't get so focused on the prize or getting published and being the big contract, that has to be kind of a secondary mm -hmm. to what you're, you're doing. One thing that I've been struck by over the years, and I've been in publishing a really long time now, is even as things have changed drastically, and here I am sitting here with my reader and all that jazz, <laughs> the relationship between the editor and the author, yes, there is less time to edit, but there is still some editing at some places. And also the client and the agent so much of it is about the work, which is great. I mean, it, it feels really good. It's a great kind of focus. And it, it feels old-fashioned. And also, the pace of our industry, I feel that compared to other industries, to other media businesses, the pace of ours is glacial. <laughs> and, and there are certain advantages to that, because groundworks are late. 
and that really helps your book. And there's, and there's a certain pleasure in having the time to do that. I want to ask, um, other than this kind of a panel, where would writers meet agents? How, how can they meet agents? Is it just through the writer's market that they respond out of the book, or what would you suggest? Yeah. I've been to San, San Francisco Writers Conference this year. I've been to the uh, Fort Collins Writers Conference. I'm going to one in Vancouver. And I'm taking a cruise, which I've never done, because I get seasick. But everybody has promised me that these boats are so big. I'm going as a guest of the Mystery Writers of America down the coast of Mexico for a week in November. Ah, boy. No, the thing is you can go to conferences. You can go to UCLA and SC and take classes and find out who, who in the class has an agent. Some of you may have agents. I'm not going to ask for hands. Uh, you can uh, go on to online investigating. Uh, Lots of interviews, uh -huh. listening. Yeah. I do a lot of conferences. I think that's a really great way to kind of do a more informal uh, way to just you know, pick up the network and, 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 and maybe not always be so focused on what you might get at the, the moment, but establishing the relationship that you can kind of develop. I mean, you know, we got, there's always these tales about, you know, people stalking us in the women's room. And, <laughs> you know, and I just like it when I meet an author that just chit chats and doesn't even pitch me something. And, and, then, and, then, I, and then I like them. And then I'll say, what does anybody got? And they're like, really? Because they've been taking like hours of classes about how to pitch to me. And they're like, ready. And I'm like, yeah. like just, just send me what you got. And they're like, okay. Because, and, and, I mean, you can tell me, it, you know, one of the things about your work, but until I actually read it and see it on the page, I have no way of really seeing it. Maybe you're really good at pitching yourself in, in person. And, and I have to tell you, a lot of my clients, are the, the ones that are kind of are the stealthy ones are really quiet and modest. And, 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 and then I, I read your work and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then the other ones are like, well, it's going to be a bestseller, and I'm going to be in channels. And you, know, and you get it, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's illiterate. So. <laughs>
I always recommend um, when I meet people at conferences that want to send me their work is make sure that you have the man put, I always recommend them to put their manuscript if it's, if it's fiction, put it away for a little while and then go back to it. And also have, um, and not necessarily somebody who's in a writing program, but I, I always think it's really good to have in your in your back pocket sort of your secret reader. Um, somebody that reads a lot of popular books that are similar to what you're writing or I don't mean popular like commercial, but just well written, have has gotten uh, great reviews. And someone like that 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 you envision is your audience for that book and then see what they might come up with because um, you know, I will take projects that need some work, but I think it's really helpful if you can kind of get some of those rough edges that it's a secret reader that you can have a look at your work first. And, and just don't be so, um, don't be premature in watching your work. Get it done, get it done, but don't be hasty about when it's written. Um, I would say research the agents that you're interested in really well and make sure, it usually a lot of information is available online such as <coughs> recent sales, what the agent's commission structure is, that sort of stuff. So if an agent you are very interested in offers to represent you, you should already know some of the basic stuff about them. But there are some questions that you should ask. You should ask, um, Will you share with me the list of editors that you're going to go to? Because I've had a lot of people come to me after they're dissatisfied with their current agent and they can't find out where their work has gone. And I don't want to represent them in that circumstance. Um, and will you share rejection letters with me? And you want the answer to be yes. Um, you might also ask them what kind of, and you want to do this in a very conversational, not in a kind of consumer reports way. Um, <laughs> What kind of strategy do you have for submitting my book? Are you imagining submitting it very widely? Are you imagining submitting it selectively? Um, do you tend to work with an A list and a B list? I mean, however you want to put this so that you can find out what the agent's strategy is because that's helpful to know. Don't forget that you make, a writer makes it a lifetime career. It's not just while you're in school, oh, it seems like a good thing to do because I really don't know what I want to do. And maybe you don't know what you want to do, but you found yourself in this master's program. And that can mean that you write your first book, and you are thrilled that you finished it, and then you start the editing part, the rewriting part. You know, writing is rewriting, no matter where it is. It's a cliche, but it's so true. Tani O'Dell, Back Roads, I was mentioning very earlier. Backwards was her first published book. She wrote, she wrote about seven or eight other books before that. And my associate in New York, who had been for 22 years a very fine editor, had tracked her. And Tani gave her the new book. And it was like, Eureka, it's happening. <laughs> she suddenly had learned her craft. It doesn't happen overnight. If you play the cello or you play the piano, but if you're a jock and you're, you know, a woman can be a jock, you know, you, you learn how to be an athlete. Being a writer is being an athlete. And you have to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Someone said to me, I've been drawing. I have to go nonverbal sometimes so that I don't go crazy reading or negotiating contracts or what else, whatever else I'm doing. But if someone said, you have to keep your hand moving. So take that into what you do as a writer and realize that, that maybe it will be your first or your twelfth script that sells, your seventh or eighth novel that will sell. But we'll, we'll suddenly learn how to do it. You have to learn the craft, and it takes time. What you can't do is buy talent. You either are great storytellers, and I think nonfiction people are storytellers as well, or you're not, and hopefully, if you if you allow any of us to discourage you, any of us to discourage you, then you shouldn't be a writer. Because you have to believe in your own work, or it will never work. Let's open it up for some questions. Yes. Can I ask Ken about uh, screen play submissions to the same advice, the file, and uh, kind of full pages embedded in, and also uh, what kind of taste uh, genres you're looking for? 
I'm looking for what I think in, in film and in television and books, just something that knocks me out. And I don't know what that is. In screenplays, I would call it the killer writing sample. And maybe it's the same thing with a book. Sometimes an editor will say, you know, this just isn't a book for me, but wow, what a great writer. What other books does he or she have? And of course, ideally, an agent takes the writer on, at least in the film area, who has two or three other scripts behind them, or as well as pitches, and as well as pitches. So that, so that if the producer says, not for me, what a great writer, send this person in. I know that you're going to go into that office and be able to pitch other stories that might keep that person's interest. You've got to get started somewhere. Is it sent in the same way, like the bio, 10 pages within the man? You know what? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Not the. Uh, no. Because we don't, we don't want, to be, we want to be careful about anything that could be uh, kind of virus. Anybody? Yes. I, I just worked with him and it's very interesting 
when I we all have the experience that sometimes your clients will sort of bury their best assets and then start talking to them yeah. like, what do you mean that you did this or you know? And, you know? So a lot of times the biography that I get is completely <coughs> turned upside down by the time I work with them and I, you know, I, I'll, I basically interview and you do 20 questions and just try to pull everything I can and, and filter and prioritize what I think an editor will find of interest. Plus, you know, the editors, I see lots of books that will just say in the back, you know, this, this person, you know, they're a homemaker and they have eyes, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. They, they just had a great idea and, and they put it together and, and, it, and it became a book. Tom, you hit me. Yeah, I have two questions. The first one is the quick one. Um, if we have a blog, do you want to know in a query letter like the size of the number of hits per month or anything like that? And what's worth mentioning in terms of that? And then this is a multidisciplinary program that we're in here where we, um, we have an emphasis in say fiction or creative nonfiction or screenwriting. Some of us have projects in all of these areas. Like we might have a novel, we might have a memoir, we might have a screenplay. When we write you a query, do you want a query for one project at a time, or would you like to hear about numerous projects? I, I only want, I want to query about one project at a time. If you're doing fiction and nonfiction at the same time, before you send it to me, choose the one that you want me to consider. I get those all queries all the time saying I have five books. And I just delete those immediately. <laughs> well, the reason, partly, is that you say, well, why haven't they sold? <laughs> why are you coming to me? Or, or are your expectations <laughs> Or I'm just overwhelmed. I can't pick up. I had one guy approach me with 10 books and he was not. I was like, he, he had, you know, he sounded pretty interesting. I kind of said, you know what, you're just going to have to choose one. Choose one. And because I, I don't know your writing, I don't know anything about you. And, and it's, it's just too overwhelming to be, you know, from all that. Or I'm writing a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just add to that, I think you should send the book as closest to your heart. And that's really what this is about, is, is sending what you love and not just who came and say, leave it up to us. That usually indicates to me that the person is clueless, that they haven't, they don't even know what's close to their heart, and they don't know what the agent is doing, and they don't know what they're doing. This is my experience with that. Yeah. Oh, just about the blog question. Yes, uh, yes. Like the number of hits per month good. and when you shouldn't mention that. Right? Is it, there, I start shaking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yes. find it is good. Yeah, there are certain things that, you know, if someone says, I was in the who's who of blah, 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 okay. Or I had an article in my local, I did. I've had so many people that have written queries saying that they're published and then it ends up it was a, it was a letter to the editor. <laughs> Of America West. 
and I think it costs twenty or twenty five dollars one day, and another five dollars. Until about five six years ago, you could only send in screenplays, and once the project is finished, however you've decided the authorship is, meaning is it something you've co-authored it by the time you finished, register it that way. The writers go from there to the West. You can always do that. It establishes a date of creation, which in California courts will hold up for five years. But the registration is there for five years. You have to re-register after the five years. Say you have the sort of book or the screenplay. Um, if you're going to be working with this gentleman, I would highly recommend that you have a written agreement with him as to what your role is. And if you become the co-author, how are you going to split advances and royalties? Does that answer your question? And what kind of credit you're going to get? Yes, and the credit, of course. And, and what about, you said life rights? Does that mean like life rights right to sell it? Or is life rights, example, I was involved with the TV, I think it was Lifetime. I think it was Lifetime. Uh, years ago, right after the Oklahoma City bombing. And it was called The Oklahoma City Bombing Dash the Priscilla Salyers Story. And a producer I know found Priscilla Salyers, who had been a secretary in the murder building, the one that was blown up. And she also found the fireman who found Priscilla in the building. I won't give you the graphics of what she looked like when he found her. It was actually very funny. But uh, those are their life rights. And I negotiated on their behalf with the producer so she could then deliver those rights to Lifetime. So when you say rights, you're really saying story. Story rights. Life their life story. Their life story yeah. rights. The rights to their to life their story. Life. Does that answer that? Yeah. Yeah, um, could you uh, just say a little bit about uh, word count and how important that is for you in the submission? Word count, how important that is for you in the submission? I have a thought on that. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, when you come to me with, with a book and you say, I just finished my manuscript and it's 250,000 words <laughs> long and I want you to read it, I, I'm instantly mentally constipated. <laughs> You're asking me to scan my eyes over your 250,000 words. I would not put that in at all. This is just a personal thing. I, it makes me feel so overwhelmed going into it. And it's always difficult to start reading anything. So that, that's why I think you have to put the word count in your query letter, though. I mean, I, I would be suspicious if somebody didn't put the word come in, and it's really important because it's something of a diagnostic tool so that if somebody's querying something over, a, I don't know, 130,000 words, I mean, really over 100, I think we start going, mm -hmm. Well, I always think that there's certain genres like um, uh, that have a more epic, longer time horizon, so fantasy and and so certain sci-fi and certain more, they, they can kind of get a, a, a way with the longer, right? Um, um, I think the Miss Babylon is pretty long. But, but for me, like for your standard um, commercial or literary um, fiction, I always think the sweet spot is between, you know, seven and niche. Do you have a sense of page count for those yeah. numbers? Um, and it's about four, between 350 and 80 to 100,000 words is between 350 and 400 pages, yeah. about 350. I've worked with some clients where their manuscript was over 400 pages, and I really worked with them to kind of, kind of shed some pages. And you know, I have to tell you, after they, they, they just cut some scenes or work, reworked it, they didn't even miss it.
but you know, I'm always kind of putting putting the experts on diets. If I could add something here, the trend is towards shorter novels. Um, this James Patterson thing, I think, was sort of indicative of what's happening with a lot of novels. The other thing is, keep in mind, publisher, if you're writing wrong, a publisher can't price a first novel at a high price to justify the printing costs and the paper and everything else. So um, they tend to look for a shorter shorter novels, but that, you know, there's always the exception of, I'm reading Shantaram, which is like 800 pages in a trade paperback, and how did that get there? So there's, I think if you look, if you hear anything today, there's always the exception. Yeah. Yeah. Heard about nonfiction, fiction, where do things stand with memoir? That wonderful hybrid. I think memoirs are uh, they've done really well, and just all you have to think about is that the memoir has to work <coughs> in the same narrative um, framework as fiction. A great story that try not to be too weird. You know, you don't. You want to be able to find a good spot to introduce the reader to the story, and not you know, start with line four and you know. <laughs> You know, so that, that to be honest, is, uh, I think they're very popular. Yeah, I agree. The, the mystery memoir, I think, is trending down. You know, I was locked in a class at that kind of thing. But I think, I think the Eat, Pray, Love, or Eat, Pray, Loathe, as some of us call it, is very, very strong. Um, editors are still looking for that. I read The Glass Castle, which came out a couple of years ago. I just thought that was phenomenal. I was like, wow, I, I was real impressed. And, and, I mean, it had a bit of a misery, but she was so kind of distant from the guy. I didn't, I didn't feel that part of it. To me, it was just like, oh my gosh, she embraced it out of anger. You know, that she's got all these tales of growing up. So do you need a platform or a proposal on that end? You know, I, I've done some of my memoirs as if they were a novel, and I've done some where they've been more like. Um, a non-fiction book proposal. It just depends on if your memoir covers a real uh, specific topic that may lend itself to providing more background information and that's why you, you know, are the right person for that particular topic, then that might be... Um, it could be quite short. The yeah. more of the manuscript yeah. you have, the shorter the proposal can be. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, was mentioning something about information being very important information being very um, kind of got the way that was personal information. So I understand with nonfiction, it would be vital for for where the individual writer is coming from to write that book. But, but if you're writing fiction or anything else, would you still say that the um, writer's bio or their life story? Not like the entire the well, life or you know, when that kind of background information about the writer and how they present that. Well, I think if you have an MFA from a, you know, an incredible school or you get published in literary journals, you should always include those. But those are important. It also just depends on if there's something about your background that kind of informs the work. And um, I, I had a, a client who was writing um, a fictional uh, women's fiction where there was a storytelling element within her novel. And then I found out that her grandfather was Green of Edelheim, which is who wrote this definitive. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, and, and I, maybe because I, I took those courses and I thought I was going to and she didn't even think anything. It just sort of came up in conversation. So I, I put that in because I thought it was really, and that's a name drop. Yeah, it was a name yeah. drop. It, but it also, it, it explained why she was writing about yeah. what she was writing about. Because he would tell stories when she was growing up. And I just thought that was really, I found that really cool. When I say name dropping, I never mean it in a pejorative way. It's a strategy. Yeah, it has to kind of, it has to make sense to her. Um, with my understanding, all who's a mystery writer, and the mysteries are set, she, her character, the sleuth, is um, a Bureau of Land Management agent named Jamaica Wild, who has an Indian family, kind 
she's white, but she has an Indian family, kind of an honorary Indian family. And I learned in Sandy's query letter that Sandy had the same thing. That really intrigued me. And that was part of the reason why she emailed me at a time when I was not accepting email queries. This was some years ago at this point. And the email said, can I send you something? And I often think that I could have just very easily thought to myself, no. <laughs> Sometimes I opened it. And it was, you know, she sent me her first chapter. Sometimes I get very ornery. It's like, I'm asking for the first three pages. She sent me the first chapter, and it was a perfect first chapter. Her whole approach was so professional and rewarding. Um, it made a really big difference. But finding that out about her really piqued my interest. Did you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of a related, I guess, in terms of what you include in the package specific, but um, I've got a friend that's an uh, industrial designer, professional, he's always said, if you ever finish a project, I'd love to take a crack at designing the cover. And I know if you did, it would be a good job. Um, so I'm wondering, is that a kind of two lines to be sent that in with the thing, if you guys ask for more pages, uh, is that overkill, is that putting the cart way before the horse, or does it sort of just help you get a better idea of what the package is and what, what I like it. is a final product? I'm very susceptible to that. <laughs> and I think other people would find it irritating. Okay. I really, I like it. I hope he'd be a really good artist. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I know it is. No, but I, I'd like to see it too. I mean, that's just different. And you have to, you know, there's always, again, there's always this question about what you should and shouldn't do. And, and I, I, I sold a memoir about a woman who raised Bart out of the bedroom for 20 years. Leslie <laughs> Yell. She's and, and, what? I didn't know what she said. She, she was an animal biologist and she raised, uh, she, she worked at Caltech when she was like 21, 22, and that. And that. Um, owl lab. And she ended up uh, uh, raising a barn owl, chick owl in her bedroom for 20 years. And when she first came, she had a T-shirt with this cute, like two-month-old owl back lip, looked like a little angel thing. And I was just so, I was like, I don't care. I just want to see the book. Don't even talk to me. I want to see the book. And, and, I, and, I, and I ended up using that image as an attachment when I send it out to editors, which I never do, I never send attachments, I never send uh, artwork ever, but I knew, I knew that this book was told them, and it did. And I thought about a little thing out. something that Sally just said is so important if you started to say there are no rules. We're giving you the most often this is the best way to do things for us individually. But why not? You're asking a question. Give us information that says not only are you really interesting, so that we can we have to sell you. You have to sell us on your work and then we have to sell you based upon your work. And by the way, our reputations are only as good as your work is good. So when we send in something to an editor, or a studio, or a network, or a producer, whoever it might be, um, that's our, you are our reputation. So show us how to help sell yourself. Sell the material. And by the and bottom line, if the material isn't good, no matter who you are, it isn't going to help. Yeah, and it can't be a gimmick either. I mean, you know, this was an unusual situation because the photo was so emotionally connected, which related to the story, it all worked together, so it made sense. I mean, sometimes as they just we get the weirdest things in the mail. You know, you know, like socks or you know Miles of socks. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> sent us some, you know, thousand dollar check. Yeah. Yeah. We you know, we tear those things up. But, you know, don't don't go the gimmick route, but but if you have a gut instinct like Angela was sort of saying, you've got to, you've got to have a passion and have an overall sense of what you have and what best serves it, and then, and then go with that. I, you have a question? Yeah, I just had a, um, because you all see the um, skipping the email down, and you said that you almost sometimes go through it very quickly. Do you have suggestions for such a lines? Like that, that will make you read it. Like, can you send me? Can, can I send you something? Seems like you might just very easily read that. I do not like hypotheticals. Did you ever want to read about a?
or did you ever wonder? Like, did you ever wonder? <laughs> 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 well, that's the video. And also, I always think don't spend too much time in the beginning to say, I have a book, and this is the title, and I want to have you look at it. I'm you? a bitch in my head. I don't mind if it just is Dear Sally, and then go right into it. That's, that's what I prefer. So why do you need a story? I, I would even have that in mind at the time. Well, I mean, that is helpful, though, because then, you know, I, I, I can take more time when I get a query from someone I've met at a conference uh, or even like this uh, program, I'm going to take a lot more time responding. Even if it's not the right project for me, I'm going to write more personal response because I think that's our commitment and, you know, part of being of this community. And so I want to make sure that I give you a personal response that you know, might be more than I would for someone that was I just want to do two more questions so that we Yes, okay. Um, what if you self-publish? You try to get in and you decide to self-publish and your book starts selling. Does it hurt your chances then to try to get an agent? Yes, the, the magic words there were if your book starts selling. It's it's the self-published work we see where someone has just kind of slapped it between covers mm -hmm. but then hasn't really made any effort to sell it. But when there is evidence that you can show that something has started to sell, then publishers do take, publishers and therefore agents do take interest. Sometimes also I think some of authors that have approached me with, with especially with fiction, they've, they've gotten kind of bad advice and they went the self-published route and it just was, they had 500 copies in the garage and they're pretty fine. And if I really, really like it, I, I kind of pretend like it just didn't happen. You know, if you have a soul in it and it's really well written and it, but you, just, you just kind of got caught up in the whole, you know, there are companies out there that are trying to make money on offers and sometimes they're a little predatorial too. So, like, so we run into people that have kind of that happen. So I just, it, it, it's not on Amazon and so it's just brand new. But if you sold a lot, then you can leverage that. Right, that's ammo. One last question, anybody? Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask about reality shows. So when you products, how they, how, how, how does that work? How does a reality show submission work? Correct. And is it come script home. format? Is it just a you know, that's a really good question. I'm actually having lunch next week with one of the best and most successful reality show producers that I've known personally for the past 20 years. But we periodically catch up and we always talk business. And I've sent him a couple of times one page proposals. But he's always said to me, I know in the first line or two whether or not I'm even interested. And in the last one he said, believe it or not, and I'm not kidding you, I have this exact project in development. So a one page proposal to get the series you do. And be sure you know what other series are out there. Good. Well, we are so fortunate to have you here and to impart your wisdom. And I know some of the students will want to come up and meet you. First thing you're going to get those cards. So thank you very much.